Let's just dive right in. Today we're looking at two people, Sophie Odulami Ajayi. She was born Odulami and later at the age of 41, got married to Mr. Ajayi and so became an Ajayi. It's a very interesting story for me. In, in, in the uniqueness of the story is that is the age at which she became, she came into her calling and what she did at that age. As we look through it, you know, as I look through it, I just ask myself questions. As a teenage girl, did I have the courage to do, <laughs> did I have the courage to do any of the things that she did or defy the authority that she defied? Not, not in an arrogant, proud way, but because she was being forced to choose and she chose to choose God. If that's, if there's any, if that sentence is, is, is correct. And that cost her, it cost her to follow and it cost her at an early age. It cost her to follow God. She made that choice all by herself. She could have chosen a different path, but she insisted. And so I, I was quite we don't have the book, this book doesn't say too much. It doesn't go into in depth about her, but we see a little bit more about her in when we come into the second story, which is on Daniel Orekoya, because they cross path as most of them did at that time, because they were in this around the same generation. They were in the same generation and there weren't many movements. Um, there were not many, um, revivals and I don't know what to call it, these movements that were quite spirit-led, quite uh, prophetic, evangelical. What she had was the mainstay, the Anglican church, the Methodist, what we call Orthodox today was Orthodox back then. They were very conservative. They played by certain rules and nobody broke away from those rules. So if you try to break out of those rules, then you were... Well, Here we go. That's the way. <laughs> you yes, yes, it was it caused great problems. So how did they function? How did she function? And what made her how did she get to how did her name get into this book, this book of fame or this hall of fame? Now I just go back into a little bit and talk about where she comes from. Forgive me, I didn't learn how to pronounce the name, but I know that she's from a town five miles out of Ijebu Day called Is Isonye. Please, Tolu, can you help me? Isonye, I think it's it's called. Error, the story, I'm the wrong person, wrong person to pronounce. <laughs> to know that, please come to our rescue and save these people. These evil, evil people here. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, um. The story of her, of the town she comes from is quite interesting. And we're told that this, the town was founded by a woman who um, was one of the a princess that followed, what's his name, Obata, Obata, um, I wrote it as mm. a, Obanta. Obanta. Obanta, yes, Obanta, yes. He followed Obanta, she followed Obanta, who is supposed to be the founding father of Ijebu, out of, um, she followed him out of Ilefe and so journeyed with him way back. We don't know what century, how many years ago. Um, so they started Ijebu and then she moved five miles out of Ijebu to carve mm -hmm. out a niche for herself. And that's how this Isoyin town came about. Mm -hmm. So, um, how did Christianity, this is a popular story and a very interesting one that is important for us to learn how Christianity came into Ijebu land. This was around 1894. The British who brought Christianity, they had been at loggerheads with the Ijebus and Ijebu, the Ijebu, Ijebu towns were a critical, like a crossing point. I remember a few years ago at work, I, I was in conversations with some of my colleagues and some of them were from Ijebu and some weren't and some were saying, well, it's you people's fault 
that Christianity spread in Nigeria because you guys gave the British leeway and they came in as soon as they came through you, they entered us if you had stood your ground. So I, they had that conversation. I, I didn't pay much attention. Fast forward how many years now I'm beginning to understand some of those things that my colleagues were talking about. So the British eventually were able to win over the Jebus and they sent the Jebu natives who had been who had, um, were living outside of Ijebu land. They had four Ijebu natives living outside Ijebu land had converted to Christianity and thus they sent back to the Ijebu land to convert the rest of the lands or their people to Christianity. This was around 1894. That was the, one of the earliest mentions of um, Christianity in Ijebu land, uh, uh, according to this book. Now, fast forward a few years later in 1897, a man by the name of Ibi um, Ogumefun, who a Christian worker, was posted to this Isoni town as a cat kid. He demonstrated a very strong evangelical and missionary spirit that in less than six months of being posted into this town, he was able to present 65 members for baptism. If you've been following, if you've been following this review, you know that to bring a, to convert somebody way back in, uh, at that time, to bring a convert ready for baptism, they would have gone through series of teachings and training. They have to learn the cat, you know, they have to learn some recitations and some Psalms and things like that, um, some prayers by heart. And that was part of the test they did before they are baptized. So it took some people some years to get there. This man, this is a testament to how rugged and how aggressive this cat kiss was because in less than six months, he had 65 members. It's like going to a new town and you're having 65 converts, uh, people coming to Christ in less than six months. I tell you guys, I'm not, I'm not really familiar with, it's not a something that I'm familiar with people giving their life to Christ. Maybe the odd one or two every now and again, because either everybody seems to be born again or we just like things the way they were, uh, they are. But yeah, so this was in, I think about in November of 1897, that six, when he presented his first 65 members for baptism. Then he continued to work aggressively, this from Katkis. And in 1900, three years later, a church building was completed in this town, in spite of the many setbacks, in spite of the fights and the challenges, this man just knew how to fight. He was aggressive and he knew how to light a fire. I, I read about his work and I'm thinking, wow, this man, wow. Uh, he was a real revivalist. He knew how to, he was carrying on, on him something quite special. And he won, he must have won the heart of the people or his message, his method, really did hit a home run. He drew the hearts of people to, 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 to God. So it was under this hot spiritual climate that a man called David Odulami, who had two wives, became a Christian. This man, David Odulami, is the father of Sophie Odulami Ajayi. What do we know about him? I just wanted to mention the heritage of Sophie or what the kind of bloodline, if, uh, so to speak, that she was coming from. You know, he was, he was um, um, a traditionalist, like everybody was at the time before they converted to Christianity. When he became a Christian, two interesting stories were told about him. First story is that, you know, the Christian converts were, they would have early morning prayers in church. And so um, these were farmers and what have you. They, they, they had converted from whatever they were worshiping. As they started to go for this early morning prayers, they also started to meet strange and untimely death. And then there was a conflict between the church and the traditional powers. We, we can hazard a guess as to why. I mean, one, one, one club is, one association is depleting and the people are converting and jump, going over to to the other side, it's, it's a threat to any power. It's a threat to any organization. But we are told that Mr. Dulami instinctively knew the source of these troubles, why all these people were dying out and why they were just experiencing strange 
um, strange negative experiences. And then he did something about it. He went and performed a reversal on the spot that has been enchanted to work against the church and its members. It is unclear to us how he did this, but suffice to say, the Christians stopped dying and the traditionalists started dying. We don't know what he did, but he reversed the curse. Then the second interesting story about this man is that there's a spiritual and traditional cult group called Ajimo or Agemo. I'm not sure how it's pronounced. It was a symbol of um, unity in the, um, is a traditional sim symbol or spiritual unity and everything in Ijebu religious cosmology. They had high rituals, taboos, fortifications. They had things like women were forbidden from seeing them and no one was allowed to point at them. We don't really know what the cause of the friction between this cult and Mr. Odulami, but what we do know is that the spiritualists cursed him, cursed Mr. Odulami. And how did he respond to that? He rose up and cursed them back. <laughs> and in his curse, he said none of them will live to see the next year or ever enter that town again. Guess what, people? They all started to die one by one. And it is told that, you know, they never, as far as we can tell, you know, that cold group just stayed away from the town. Very, very interesting. So that's, that's, I say this to say, you know, this was a clearly a powerful man. You know, there was something um, in his bloodline, in his calling that just has access to a lot of spiritual power. And sometimes, um, sometimes, oh, but the enemy jumps in and perverts it until there is redemption. What God wants to do is to redeem everything that he has given to us because the enemy, the devil doesn't create anything. You know, these witches and wizards and occultic people. I see them as people who God has called them to. And so they're using it. The abuse of a thing is unknown. Abuse is one of the purpose of a thing is unknown. Abuse inevitable and that's what you know, usually happens so going on to sophie herself she was born in i think around 1900 because by 1918 1919 when she makes her what i'll call her debut she was about 18 19 this was when the influenza which is much like the covid 19 epidemic was sweeping through the world and they were facing similar crises that we've been facing in recent times People were dying. There was no cure, no real remedy. If you caught it, they tried at best to manage it as a flu. But, you know, most people died. It really was ravaging the world. Nobody had an answer. And Sophie caught this flu. While on her sick bed, struggling, battling with pain, five days of this, she began to hear voices. Or oh, oh, maybe some people would say she was hallucinating whatever you call it. But one of these voices said to her, I shall send peace on this house and on the whole world. Peace meaning, um, the house meaning her father's home and the whole world. The, world. the world war is ended. That's what the voice said to her. And then the voice again said to her to tell everyone who was affected by the flu to go and wash in the coming rain and they would be healed. So very interesting because she tells her father, who tells the catechist, who gives her the pulpit, gives her the audience in church, and she makes this proclamation. This is what the voice said to me. Guess what, people? The rain came, and the town troops into the streets to get washed by the rain. And anybody who did this, obeyed, got healed. This is how Sophie came on stage. Overnight, as we may call it, she became a wonder, a phenomenon. People wanted to listen to her. And, you know, people just wanted to listen to her. This thing you said happened. Is there more where that came from? What else have you heard? What else should we do? You know, people listen to a voice that tells them that, you know, speaks to their need in desperate times. They respond to that. And more so, they look to see if there will be 
can there be more? You know, people are hungry. The Bible says that the creation is in, in yeah. earnest expectation is groaning for the manifestations of the sons of God. God. And sadly, we don't always have the manifestations of the sons of God. What we tend to have is manifestations of the counterfeits, people stealing our place. But thankfully, not in this, not in this case. Sophie was the son of God, or is the son of God, or daughter of God for feminists out there. A daughter of God, and she was truly caring and speaking the heart of God. So I'd like us to just dive into the conversation and look at some of the things that marked her ministry. As I said, her story is very short. Uh, the account that we have in this book is very short, but I would just start off or continue by asking my panelists to tell us what they know and what they've summed up about Sophie's life, what happened to her after this encounter and after people got healed. How did she move from there to what was the next phase of her of her life? Um, would you, I'd like to start with you. Okay. All right, so, um, so basically Sophie, let me go back to, after the, um, after the, let me see. Ugo, Ugo can go actually, let me gather my thoughts on this. Okay, can I just share, um, I was quite impressed with this story. I was quite, and she, first of all, she was even the first notable prophetess in Nigeria. And I find that particularly interesting because for me, we're in such a situation where we're always taking Bible classes and guidance and courses, but you find she didn't have a forerunner, so to speak. So she was literally riding on the wings of the spirit. And for me, who's such a Bible class or class, some sort of Bible study person, it's particularly, um, it's a reminder for, for me, for what God, God has been saying to me, that you can do the courses, you can do all of that, but you will have to step away from them and let God move in the way he's, he wants to move. So, you know, Sophie didn't have any self-help book or how to, how to be Sophie, but she just went with God. And, you know, her, her intimacy with, with God was, well, I mean, there's a part of the book where they, where they say, and I, that exactly won my heart, where they talked about Sophie's God. You know how they say the God of Elijah, the God of Yah. It was more like they talked about Sophie's God. I'll go, I'll go to that page real quick. It says, um, Sophie's God is a smiling God, the God who turned water to wine for the pleasure of his people, the God who inhabits the spiritual realms. And, you know, you think of um, when Jesus talked about the Lord's Prayer, and he started, you could have started with, um, but I know, or you are the creator of the universe, but he starts with simply our Father. And you realize that that's how God wants to be known. And I, I like how, how it was termed Sophie's God, because that, that means that that's how God, Sophie presented God to people. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I, I, I enjoyed the story. And she reminds me of a Jumoke, I don't know, of a modern day Jumoke, I don't know. I think that's, when I, when I think, when I read about Sophie, it's Jumoke that comes to mind. And then there's, there's a story here where her father takes her to the wood to try to strangle her. And for, for every time he tried her, her neck would snap back to its original position. And that was particularly, <laughs> interesting and then she walked in you know she'll try to enter a room and then she'll get into the room without the key then they'll, they'll try to get to the evil first to kill her when they get back she'll already be at the house before they even get there you know what i mean and it's you know those are dimensions i particularly would like to walk in so she's sophie was living my life <laughs> okay <laughs> you, 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 <laughs> jumped, enjoyed all of that. you jumped way 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 ahead into oh, into the into the story but let me just say something you mentioned that um, way back then they didn't have a lot of forerunners, and so they didn't have the Bible study, master class, prophetic class, how to pray, how to listen, hear God, how to this, how to that. It's true, they didn't have all of that. You know, in fact, what we see is later on, they got connected, their connection was with ministries outside of the country. In fact, one ministry in particular has been very important, has played a big role in, in um, helping the church in Nigeria start up or get established. And that was um, the Faith Tabernacle from America because they would get these leaflets, pamphlets from Faith Tabernacle. And this was way, way back in a hundred years ago. So it's not today. They didn't have social media posts. They didn't even get it by email. They, you know, it took months before correspondents crossed the ocean. Right. And when they got a, a pamphlet or one of these 
what do they call them now? People cherish them, they okay. treasure them, they probably memorized every line and they shared it amongst themselves. They, they valued every word, they took every word, they dissected and chewed on it. They had very little resources. It's always so remarkable to me and I, I, I make a note to always mention how little resources they had back then. They fed a lot on the Bible, the plain Bible. The plain, they opened the Bible just as it is. They didn't listen to any sermons. There were no sermons to listen to, you know, and they studied the Bible every day. They read chunks in volumes of the Bible every single day. They meditated on it. They prayed about it. It was just, I just, I'm just like, Lord, wow. To whom much is given? You expect so much from us. Well, this we have so much. I, I don't see, I'm struggling to see a commensurate return on his investment. I'm struggling when I look at the lives of, of these people. But yes, yes. those yes. are my, so some go, of my, let me, let me go with the story now. Let me go ahead. Yes, go on, sure. So I think I'll start from her education. Of course, you know her dad, um, um, I think you already, Roberta already made reference to the fact that her dad was in the church. So of course she had a good education because of course all the education was in the Anglican church. So that came out then. Um, it happened in the season of the influenza. Sophie, her ministry started when Sophie came down with the influenza actually. So in that time, um, I think one of those days she was actually lying down after five days, sorry, of being in pain. That's when she hears, has her first encounter which is when she hears a voice. Right, she hears the voice, and um, the voice you, you made reference to the voice and um, the message the voice sent, sent, sent to her, right? And what was interesting here was for me, I, what I said is, I think, I think Sophia's boldness and um, her fearlessness came from the conviction because she had gotten a revelation from God, and I think that that's what that's that's how life is for most of us. If you see cases of Bible cases of people, whether it's Elijah or whoever it is, or uh, Abraham, the father of faith. It was because they had heard the voice. That's why they had such a strong conviction. I think that's also why Sophie had such a strong conviction um, that this message was from God. And when she told them to everybody to go and bathe in the rain, um, of course, the healing came. That was also the birth of um, what the book termed the divine healing. That was also the birth of the divine healing. Anyway, like, like, like we see today in today's church, um, when Sophie's ministry started to work strong, um, we also see that she started to have issues. Whether the, I, I termed it the challenges that she started to face, whether it was um, from, from her father, starting from her father. I know um, Roberta also made reference to the to um, the, some of the challenges she had with him. I think it was good, I made reference to it. One of the things was, of course, the father was trying to quell her voice. Um, he took her into the, he took her into the bush, we made reference to that. He took her to the bush where he was trying to strangle her three times. Every time um, he tried to strangle her, her neck, neck flipped, flipped back. Then of course, it, it, it also happened that she was put in a dark room, I think for seven days. The book makes reference to how there was some magic lights, magic lamp without any oil that stayed lit um, for, for, for that period and nothing, and, and, and basically she was safe at the end of the seven day period, she came out. There was also another reference to something that happened while she was in that, um, in that, in that cave. But you know, it's, it's just amazing the kind of experiences she was having. And I, I, I you know what um, Roberta made reference to her, your 18 year old self, do you think you'd have been this bold? I think if I, if, I can't even say the one that God was sending some experiences, but I feel like there are some things that will happen to you that you know that you have the backing of God, right? Even I think there was at one point she she also got led because she had taken so much. She also yeah they took her to the evil forest. There was also an experience where um the uh, the spirits they were trying to kill her, so they took her to the evil forest and let said let the let the evil spirits um come and come and attack her. They took her there, and before they got back to the house. She was already in the house. So nobody could even explain how is it that these things are happening. Um, the book goes ahead to talk about how, of course, at that age, even though she could withstand it, she still had a whole life ahead of her. So she had the leading to move. Um, I think she was going to, I believe it was Ijebode she was going to. Um, that even on the way to Ijebode, then the evil spirits are not even afraid. The, they were not even afraid of harming her again. The sick, they were like, okay, let's just finish her off in public. And as she's walking down, she has this fan that whenever she uses the fan and blows it, um, she disappears. Um, so so that, that, those are some of the experiences she had. And when, when she got to her destination, um, you know, because in her dream, she had already got to, a voice had told her, go to, um, to, to this place. You know, when God sends you, I, I, when I was writing, I said, this is God's will, it's God's will. Because when God sends you on an errand, you will see that he would have told, he told somebody else 
um, if I remember the person's name, we told somebody else, I think that was, um, that she was going to be coming there. Um, who was the person? Can you guys remind me what the person was? Somebody else was expecting her. So when she got there, the person already knew she was coming. So she got in and, and, and she already started, um, she already had a place to come to. <laughs> okay, give me a second, give me a second. Um, what's the person's house name? Yes, so it was Shadare, Shadare of the Precious Stone, um, Precious Stone Church. He had already seen in a dream about her visit. So he, and he enthusiastically received her. And he goes on to say that while she was there, because she already had an education in the past year, while she was in her father's house in the Anglican Church, she was already equipped. So she just already became a teacher. So you see that all the experiences you go through in life, at times it might seem unnecessary, it might seem like I don't know why this is happening, but you see that God is actually just equipping you for the journey ahead of you. Um, so for me, those are some of the outstanding things that happened in her life. Then she, of course, um, mm -hmm. let me not jump so far into the story and let me pass it back on to Roberta um, to take it from here. Okay, um, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, so and apologies, my network is really, is being very not cooperative today, but um, we'll see how that goes. We command it to behave itself in Jesus' name. Right, so you have really jumped way ahead. So I'll pull you back a little bit more and um, let's just put some context. So what are the facts that we're trying, we're, we're attempting to share with you? At the age of 18, 19, the influenza was ravaging the world. Sophie caught the influenza and on her crisis bed, she had an encounter with the Lord where we believe is with the Lord. She heard voices and she presented that word to her father who believed her. And then her father presented it to the catechist who believed. And now I had, a, and then gave her the platform to share with the entire congregation. And following that, it, when it rained, everybody obeyed. People were willing to take her word for it because when it rained, people went out in the rain and they got healed. And I had my first question, or oh, well, one of my questions, is that I think about it. I mean, I can understand if your father believed you, because, you know, sometimes your parents, they just believe, you know, they just believe what you say as their child for one reason or the other, because they say, no, you're my child. You cannot have made that up. I trust you. I know how I've groomed you. And besides, whatever. I do a question. Why did the catechist believe the word of an 18 year old? There's no record, prior, rec prior record of anything small that she had said that came to pass, you know, but he not only believed her, he, he didn't even try to speak on her behalf and say, you know what, when it rains, maybe try and go outside. It is possible. Perhaps the Lord might want to do this, but he brought her. It's not something that people do a lot with their ministry. So I'm just, I was asking the question, is it that he, he had a conviction about what she was saying? Or is it that he was afraid of her father because her father was quite prominent in the church? Or is it that um, all hope was lost anyway? So if I perish, I perish. We're looking for, <laughs> we're looking for, I, I, I asked those questions, which doesn't, there's, you know, there isn't much of an evidence of the real reason, but I still ask that question. But following her, you know, this her debut, she became very popular and the, God started to minister to her a lot more. And she became, she knew that she was called to speak. So whenever she had an encounter, she would speak. People came to her from different towns for prayer, for healing. She would do that. She would give prophetic words, prophetic messages, and people listen. She became a sensation that it now began to bother her family. Let's remember, painted the picture that her first encounter, her father believed her and spoke to the catechist and the catechist believed her and gave her the audience and the people got healed. Then she had more encounters. And I think at some point they were like, nah, -uh, this is a bit too much. You're acting weird. You're out of your mind, behave yourself. That was a one time. Don't let it get to your head. Go back in the box. Comport yourself as you should. 
don't go around, you know, I'm making my own inferences here. Don't go around embarrassing yourself and thinking that you're some sort of a, you know, spokesman for the gods or something. Yeah. That became, but the more they challenge her, the more they try to, they yeah. try to curb her, the more she spoke. I, I look at my, I really go back personally, I go into my 18 year old self and think about like, no way, there's no way. My mother says, there's no way. There's just, there's just, I, I didn't have that kind of courage. Was she always a courageous girl or did the sudden boldness come upon her? Or I, I just have, I just have questions. And I look at the 18 year olds that are around me today. None of them have an iota of the conviction that we see in thinking about her. I think it's quite impressive, you know. So moving on with all these challenges the church were uncomfortable with this her super display and i have to say that i actually understand where they were coming from and somehow i kind of can sympathize with their with their struggle seeing her yeah. just she was just getting a bit too much and you know what i found especially in when god calls you when the fire is fresh you can be a little bit much when you got yeah. saved the first time Remember how you told people about Jesus? Like people heard about it. People, you didn't talk about, I remember myself. <laughs> yeah. If I give you instances of the things, crazy things I did or said in my youth and my zeal for God, I would have offended a lot of people. I, I know I would. I know I offended a lot of people. And I became quite in you know, people couldn't tolerate some of my excesses, but I was just so focused on Jesus. I wasn't able to listen to any of the things. So, you know, just, I had excesses. But those are some of the excesses that we go through in our journey to maturity, in our journey of God. And this is, she is 18. She's finding herself at that age and she's grappling. She's finding herself. She's, um, yes, um, Jesus only saying the author, portrayed Sophie as a lady with wisdom um, and she was level-headed. It's, it's true, it's true. That's how she's been portrayed. And you can find quite a few 18 year olds who are above their, they, 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 they are, they're exceptional. They're not, they're not the normal 18 year olds. And I would like to believe that she wasn't a normal 18 year old. Anyway, so with all these frictions and everything um, going on with her, her father tried to silence her many times and he tried to silence her, not in a very fatherly way. I think he had tried the fatherly way, it wasn't working. So he had to go a more, a more powerful way, fight fire with fire. Unfortunately, he wasn't fighting with the same type of fire. Perhaps there would have been a, you know, a breakout. Instead, he kind of regressed and started to use other dodgy means, going back, dipping his hands into what he came out of. He took her to the evil forest Imagine taking your own daughter to the evil forest and trying to wring her neck, break her neck wow. with your hands. I thought that man was had the nerve. Like if you're going to kill your child, send somebody else. So at least you don't see your child die by your own hand. I guess for him it was like, no, 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 no. I need to set an example that if nobody crosses me. You die by my very hand. I'm not afraid to. But her neck will snap back. So he will break it and the neck will snap back. After a few tries, he just knew, well, this one, beyond me so they went back home you know when i read it i just thought to myself you know the scene of these memes we have about the scene of abraham and isaac coming down the mountain and going back home after abraham had tried to kill isaac the dead silence between them like ah my father just tried to slaughter me <laughs> so i just i just wonder how that would have been how they how their journey back home would have been like my father is actively trying to kill me and we're living under the same roof. And he sent some attackers. So, you know, some spiritual forces against her. And it just, it just, everything was just not attacking her, was not getting to her because the protection of the Lord was mightily upon her. It really was. But that's not to say that she was immune from the suffering. She did go through a lot of pain and rejection because she's a human yeah. being. Um, but then we fast forward and she got the, the, um, the discerning that she, she, she's to leave and it was a sensible thing to do at that time. 
she had to leave and go and join a band of believers who believe the same thing, you know, join a community that would welcome her, support her, and encourage her walk. And this is where she, um, this is when she now left her home. And that's what Ju was referring to when she was walking. I think she had this fan and as she was yeah. going on her journey, you know, those days they trekked everywhere, they walked everywhere. When she flipped the fan or something, the people who were coming for her would either disappear or she would disappear. They wouldn't see her. So it's an invisibility fan in short that she, mm. that she had. And so that's how she found herself joining, um, joining this community of, uh, I think at the time they were called the Faith Tabernacle before they eventually evolved to Christ's, um, Christ's Apostolic, Apost um, the Apostolic Church and so on and so forth. So one of the things that um, I think Uju had started to mention, and I'll bring it to Ugo, while she was with these people, what were some of the things that we see that happen? How did she grow? How did she display her spiritual maturity? How was she received? Just generally, what can you share with us about what uh, her experience there? Um, before I say that, there's, let me take us back to one. There's a part where it says her, her spiritual gifts while she was in her village, her display of gifts caused some sensation, if not outright disquiet within the African church. So I guess that's what made her leave. So I, with, her, with her new community, I have to go for my notes to confirm what happened there. So do you want to circle back to me while I can dig up those points, please? Yeah. Repeat the question again. What do you have? What was Just tell us a bit about what you, you know, her experience when she left her town and went to join with the community of believers that God had instructed her to. Mm. So I know when she went to the believer, that I think the first thing she did was I, I was I, I made reference to it. I said how because she already had a she had a teaching background. The first thing she of course she was a teacher um, in the community, right? Um, let me see. Yeah, she was a teacher there. Then she started. Um, let me. Let me. So she joined the Nigerian Faith Tabernacle, and they were they were also expelled from the Anglican Church. So it was almost like a group of misfits who couldn't who couldn't ad, uh, adapt to Orthodox Church anymore. So they found their place. This was where um, they, they believed in healing without use of medicines and all of that. So they even had a um, not, uh, what's it called a, a, a home where people have their children, but they don't use medicine. So it was it was almost what it was like a radical faith. You know what I mean? And it was right. It was exactly what she needed at that point in time. Um, their, their, their understanding of divine healing was very definitive, radical, thorough, and original. It goes back to the original conception of healing. So, you know, she had, I mean, she's the one that brought healing to the community when they were suffering from influenza. So this first tabernacle was in line with her needs as a Christian, you know. So, that, so it went, I guess it went well there. So that's it. Yeah, then the, if you just make reference to the expansion of the faith tabernacle church across the different states, and um, talks about how Ghana, um, of course, how Ghana was more successful than the Nigeria. Um, yeah. Okay, so I'll read. I'll read from the book just to give you an understanding of who she was and the role that she played. You know, it says that Sophie was a prophetess, a revivalist, and a musicologist. She loved music a great deal. Later on, we see that um, her love for music was really stewarded by her, the man that she would eventually marry, uh, Mr. Ajay, who was the, I think, was he the keyboardist? Or she became the keyboardist of the, of the church. Yeah. And they really did love, they, they loved, they loved worship, they loved music. But, you know, she found her place in the Precious Stones church setting. She fitted well. There. She was trusted as a visioner, so she was the um, the seer of the group, so to speak. They, you know, they they had a. Um, she she really was a seer and Pastor Shadare. I think that a book should be. I don't know if it has been, but this man Pastor Shadare. There's been a lot of it. He's been everywhere throughout this book, and I I wonder if there's a a book been compiled. 
um, of what he did and the influence that he had on the foundation of the church um, movement in, in Nigeria, that would be a really good read because he, he was very, very mm -hmm. instrumental to a lot of people's growth. So she would always sit by Shadari, uh, by, sit by Shadari because of her reputation as a spirit. She became the leader of the women in the church. As I said, a revivalist. She was honored and treasured by all. She carried herself with dignity and grace, very talented and gifted as a psalmist and a musicologist. She, for many years, she was an organist of the church. She wrote many songs that are still used today in, in books. Her mm. gift as a visioner is superb, making her a trusted guide and associate of the hierarchy of the church. leadership. For instance, when the Nigerian faith tabernacle was in alliance talk with the Apostolic Church of Britain, she saw a black man um, holding a white baby, mm -hmm. which is interpreted yeah. as meaning mm -hmm. that the whites were mm -hmm. babes in understanding. Mm -hmm and were therefore not adequate as spiritual leaders to be followed. It is not surprising that Ijebode was the first to refuse the administration of the white missionaries of the apostolic church after the collaboration. And, you know, to understand this better, you would have needed to be following the book review where we've talked about the alliance between the Nigerian churches and the foreign church, especially the Ghana church with the foreign churches. They we're always looking for a covering, spiritual covering, more mm. senior people to cover them. And they were they moved from pillar to post a bit before they finally landed on their feet. And that was for different reasons, economic, financial reasons. They were quite impoverished. They needed financial cover. They needed some measure of legitimacy to be known so that it prevents all of the attacks and fights that will come against them. And it also... They too were young. You know, when you're yeah. young, it is it is advisable to come under some kind of leadership and covering. But from, from the evidence we see, the churches were not going about it the right way. And that's why they always suffered a great loss. They always suffered real problems with that. But that's the role that she played. She was able to guide her particular movement away from these many inter intermarriages. And that's just a, a powerful powerful gift that she brought to the church. Um, so in, 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 um, we're told that as spiritual and as holy sounding as she is, that she really was a very sociable woman. She loved to go for parties, well, social events. She showed up, it was happening, she was live and direct, she was well represented. Mm -hmm. She wasn't immune to, uh, she wasn't um, averse to socializing and I can just imagine you know this super spiritual prophet revivalist pastor prayer warrior intercessor coming for your birthday party your owambe your this and your that and you know that's pretty awesome you know <laughs> and yeah. I wonder how people feel when they have her in their midst like just wondering oh my god what is she seeing <laughs> which what is she seeing here are there demons here <laughs> I just, I just wonder, but she socialized and she was in touch with what was happening in her community and she was quite well known and well loved is what we know about her. Then he eventually at the, she had said she was not interested in marriage, but eventually at the age of 41, now we're talking about a hundred years ago or ish, less than a hundred years ago, she got married at the age of 41. In this right. day and age, getting married past a certain age is considered, well, not the ideal. So I wonder what prompted her to, 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 to marry. Now, who wants to take this up? Um, Ju or Ugo, just talk about a little bit. I know there's not much in the book to go by on her, and mm -hmm. we're really yeah. fast come to the end of her story. Jump yeah. into Daniel Arekoya very shortly, but any one of you want to just talk about her marriage, what if, what, how it comes across to us reading the, the contribution her marriage made to her life, if any, the challenges? Yeah, for me, you know, the way the book referred to her marriage, it felt like she was um, quite uninterested because it said, there was a part it said, it's such a person, marriage, men, children, sex, 
mean nothing compared to the glory of God. So you know that for her, it was just, it was more like a checkbox. It was just like, okay, maybe <laughs> perhaps at this time, right? Um, I've met this guy that is a music person. He's teaching me music. I've learned, I'm now a guitarist, I'm a musician. Um, the what's next the least i can do is okay let, that's how we felt like we felt like okay let's let's get married let's spend the rest of our lives together because all these things were not of interest to her i know also it goes ahead to talk about one um one other um, a, 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 a polygamous man that wanted to marry her and um it, 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 it gave her a response which explained how witty she is actually so you could see that she's and she it, it was not hard feelings i just felt like she had it was she was quite unemotional about it because when she responded to the guy that the man, sorry, that um, was polygamous. You can see that she, she no hard feelings. She just said it and she just moved on. So for, to me, I felt like this person she married was just, it was just convenient. I felt it was a, um, a case of convenience. And let's just do that. Let's keep moving. That's exactly how we felt. Yeah. Ugo, do you want to chime in there? Yeah, the book said she was fully engrossed with ministerial assignments and things of God. So and she never really addressed herself early to the issue of marriage. She had loads of suitors, but she married a man who I, I think will help her fulfill her destiny. She wasn't in a hurry. So obviously, she wasn't going to marry a man that was going to take her away from the trajectory. She was already on towards God. So, you know, she totally immersed herself in things of God, to be honest. So marriage was an add-on. It wasn't, it was, I don't think she was in church day after day praying to be married. She had found fulfillment yeah. in God. And, and, and opposed to she just married someone who was, you know, going to do her God journey with her. That's it. So they, they complemented each other, each other. They were both teachers and lovers of Christian hymns, and they shared the same spiritual values and worldviews. So, you know, so you just see, I think you, you get a glimpse of marriage as God intended, you know, because I know people praying, I want to get married, I want to get married, but God is saying, find fulfillment in me. Then at that point, when, when, once you do that, you're, what you're looking for in a spouse totally changes. You know what I mean? So it becomes an add-on, not a, not a, we must a die, die. You're, you're able to see clearly you know, what you, what you want in the spouse. And it's, in, you know, they mentioned, you know, how they have spiritual, the same spiritual values. And, and that's, that's telling. She couldn't have ended up any, any other way. Thank you for that. I think from reading the book that she married her friend, you know, I just get the vibe of she ended up with a life partner, really a life, a friend. They understood each other, they knew, he understood what she was about and he was not going to be a threat in any way, form or fashion. I think he respected the call. He recognized and respected the call on her life. And, um, and so the partnership worked. The partnership yeah. worked and she was able to continue to serve God in the capacity that she had been serving. Um, yeah. That's the that's a sense that I get. Just that sweet spot. It feels like she'd gotten to that sweet spot uh, in life where it was almost like she had it all, you know. Although she didn't have any children, even though she loved, she loved children a great deal, but mm -hmm. they were unable, they were not, children wasn't given to them. She, she expressed her love for children through children, um, Loving, by loving other children around around her. So she poured her love that way. And she seemed to be quite content that way. And I, I really, I, I liked what you said, Uko, about it, it being, being an add-on. For her, marriage wasn't the ministry. For some people, marriage is very important to your destiny, to your purpose. Really, for yeah. some people, to be able to achieve what you're called to achieve, marriage is, is of need. But for her, it's yeah. not like a reward, a, a, compan a companionship, you know, in, in her life. So going towards the end, um, do, did you want to say something before I start to? No. Okay. So we're going towards the end. We know that she continued to serve God with this ministry. She was largely with the ministry till the time of her death when... I think she died September. I was saying to myself two, two or three days ago, I was just thinking about the review that this, this timeline, this September, October season is very interesting because two characters that we're reading today had very important, uh, important occurrences in their lives or in their ministry at this time of the year. And I, and, and I said to God, oh God, 
would you please give us a gift to mark to mark the celebrations or you know as we remember and as we just take a moment to think through all of these things would you just give us gift us with something whatever you choose to give to us you know in remembrance of these wonderful people that walked with you and served you so we're told that she died on the 27th of September 1981 at the very ripe old age of 81 years old you know and when I read this, it was interesting to me because this is the first of the West Africans, Nigerians, prophets, evangelists, revivalists of that time that lived this long. The other ones typically die, what I would, I would say, a young, I was going to say untimely death, but people might argue with that. They die at mid-ministry, mid-sentence, they die either like Babalola, who knew he was, who, you know, was waiting for Jesus and decided to go and call Jesus, or like uh, Daniel, who really died in a, an unpleasant way, or, you know, Orimolade or the others. They died quite young. They didn't, most of them didn't make it to 50. She lived up to 81, and that was quite, quite interesting because wow. one of the things about long life is that you get to see the next generation you get to bequeath something to them not just the next generation many generations you, you, you know there's longevity this i know we have this message of die when your ministry is done your work is done jesus died at the age of 33 and like okay that's nice but how about we all didn't die at the age of 33 <laughs> you know how about you live old, like the patriarchs that we read uh, read about. That was that was her. Her story is short and sweet, straight to the point. This is what we know about her. She came on stage at the age of eighteen. She died at the age of eighty-one. She served the church. She, she was a prophet, a minister. She lived a simple life, very involved in community life. She loved God. As when we started, Ugo pointed out that the book says that Sophie's God was a smiling God. That interested me because way back that time, I don't think they are God. I don't think that's how they encountered God really, yeah. as a smiling, pleasant God. It was the God who yeah. was, they were fighting different challenges. They were first generation Christians who were tackling evil forces, mm. you know. So their fight was very different from what they were, not, in their prayers were not all this, you know, oh God. Nice, friends. comfortable. They were more aggressive, more fiery sort of prayer. So that that's what I loved loved about her story. Now let's jump on to the story of Daniel or Rekoya. This was a very interesting story and very sad story. I don't know why they always have that dichotomy. It's really sweet, you love it, yet the ending, it's so painful. You just ask God why, you know, it's one of those, oh God, why? But let's jump in and look at who was Daniel or Rekoya. He was quite famed. Uh, you know, I've heard snippets about him. So it was really interesting to get some facts, to put some, to put a better picture, a better frame to this man and on the, um, discover who he was, what he represented, what he did for the body of Christ. So we're told that we don't know much about his background or even when he was born. We're told about what he looks like. He was a small man and he was kind of partially blind because he had one bad eye. He couldn't see through one eye. He wasn't really, he wasn't a hunk. Just, you know, he wasn't, he wasn't a pleasant to look at person. And he was not very educated. So he didn't read much. Um, he didn't read much. So you have this semi-illiterate, not very good looking kind of man who comes to know God. And um, let's see, who wants to, who would like to take this, tell us about how Daniel Orekoya came to, came to become a Christian, became a Christian convert. Hmm.
Well, I'm trying to find how I can't remember how he became a convert, but one thing I do know is that he didn't have Sophie's heritage. I mean, Sophie's father was in the church, so Sophie had a had a footing, a foot leg in. Um, then Daniel, he could, the only book we could actually read was the Bible. So just just a reminder that even if you don't have the rich heritage others do in God, um, it's uh, everybody's invited to the party. Um, mm. For how we became a Christian, I'm just going to have to go over my notes to confirm that. So the, okay, so while you're looking at from okay, let's start from mm -hmm. when he was um, um, checking the difference between because that means we're just going to jump between um, the teachings and the traditions. I have started going up to pray, going up to the mountains to pray because that's when he got his revelation to move to uh, Lagos. Um, and that's where his um, encounter began. Sure, go into that. That's the beginning of how he became a Christian. Yeah. So, well, um, let's see his early life. Um, so Daniel, basically what he says, I'll start from, I'll just read something and I'll talk, I'll talk the story. How he began to observe, um, he started seeing differences between the teachings of the Bibles and the teachings and traditions of the church. Um, these discrepancies greatly troubled his heart. And for this reason, he would go into the bush and several times to pray concerning them. So it was in all of these trips, um, it was in one of these trips that he got a message from the, the spirit came to him and said, oh, it's time to, for him to make a trip to Lagos. And similar to what happened to Sophie, like Sophie, when she went to Ijebode, in that case, there was um, the, another person had, I think that was, what was the name again? Had had a dream, Shadira had had a dream. Uh -huh. Similar to Sophie, for Daniel, when he got to Lagos, there was a taxi driver, I think, from Milori that had already gotten a message to take him in and um, house him for, and he housed him for the period while he was there, um, gave him, fed him, um, clothed him. I think it was while he was there that he now um, said, let him start a trade. Because um, like Go was saying previously, um, Daniel had... Um, I know in the early times for you to be baptized, you need some level of education because he needed some level of education to be baptized. He had to, that was why he, the only thing he could read was the Bible. Um, so I think he had to do that. That was the only level of education he had. Then um, he started his tailoring. I think six months into, I believe six months into um, learning the tailoring, that's when he was called to ministry. Um, and he also joined the faith tabernacle, um, right? The same let, one me that pause you there. let me pause suggest. you there and yeah, just highlight let, let me pause you there yeah. and highlight uh two points mm. he was a semi-illiterate yeah he didn't read anything else but the bible, but the bible yeah. so i ask myself if you can read the bible doesn't that mean that you can read because they're exactly the same letters alphabets words just arranged differently to make different sentences. How mm -hmm. come this man is able to read the Bible, but can't read, mm -hmm. you know? That was a, a question that is, you know, a question that I asked myself, how, how was he able to read the Bible, but is known as, um, as, an, as an illiterate? That was quite puzzling to me. I'm like, I see the hand of God at work in, yeah. in this, mm -hmm. because I don't know, I, it's just interesting. Mm. Yeah. and i Can think I just it was something? from this reading the bible yeah, yeah sure go on um there's a part before as we talk about him they talk about in the study of god's great creatures of course of which oreca is one of them there's, there's something they all have in common um their insatiable hunger after god yeah. um so they call it a jubilant jubilant pining after god just like the psalm mm. says as the deer pants for the water so my soul thirsts for you so i think i think when god meets that hunger um, which I guess that's what God saw in Araka. There's nothing he wouldn't do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Araka, I call them the children of a burning heart, or tools, I call them the children of a burning heart. So I think God was responding to a hunger in him, made it able for him to read the Bible. I mean, when exactly was when Jesus, the tree was waiting for him. They say, when the, when the student is ready, the teacher will show up. That's what he was. Yeah. So, so just going back, okay, thank you. Just going back to what Uju was saying. Uh, just I want to just highlight it so we note it because that's where his journey really started. It was in his preparation for baptism and all whatnot. You're required to read, understand certain things. He was reading the Bible and he would read the Bible. Look at what's practiced, the Bible. And he just had a lot of questions like, but the Bible said this, but we're doing this. I can imagine him being a really annoying, depending on what side you're on. 
really annoying church member. Every Sunday he had a question, but John chapter five, verse two said this, shouldn't we be doing it this way? He always, he saw, I think illumination really came to him because a lot of us read the Bible and we're not able to translate it to how, uh, to our personal lives, to our church uh, community lives, or we read it, see, don't even notice the disparity. We think, oh, it's okay. It's okay now. Yeah, we do it differently. Yeah, the Bible says that, but we do it differently. It's okay. Honestly, that's what happens. Not for him. And I see this as, you know, just the, the light of God, illumination. Yeah. This really was bringing him a lot of enlightenment, opening his eyes. His spirit man was you know, coming alive to what he was reading. And there was, the danger of that is that, the danger, which is a blessing, really, a really ble- a really good blessing, is that you begin to, you're awakened in God. And the more you become awakened in God, you become restless, become dissatisfied with the order of things. That was always a recipe for disaster, for falling out with, it's a recipe for revival and also a recipe for clashes and fallout, which was rampant in those mm-hmm. days, because after a while, he had to leave by instruction to, to Lagos, quite an impromptu, you know, as he was leaving to Lagos, he didn't have much on him. He didn't know, he had never been to Lagos, didn't know where he was going to. I'm just like, the faith of these people, God told you, get up, go to Lagos. You've never been there. You don't know a soul and you got up, you two, you got up, entered the bus or or wherever you headed and as god would have it he had prepared guess who a muslim a muslim to receive him a muslim taxi driver god had instructed you know to say somebody is coming take him under your wings and that's what this man did took him in and fed him looked after him then he too decided you know i have to do something i can't really get employment because i'm 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 uneducated let me yeah. learn a trade he went into tailoring and it was while he was doing this also came into this company somebody i think the person who was learning his tailoring from introduced him to this company of believers that mm-hmm. really was the you know where he became his ministry sort of yeah. started or oh, his the fire in him was stoked and oh. groomed right okay so would you i'll let you jump in okay. here now so what you, the book also says that one of the things that um daniel really liked about the faith tabernacle i think it's aligned with his principles um holiness he was very in line with who he was so that's one of the things that yeah that really worked for him and the, the church accepted him they also made, they really accepted him, liked who he was, and they even appointed him um, a position. They even gave him, made him the head of one of the branches. I think they just opened another branch. If I can't remember where, where, where the, what the branch was, but they made him the head in that branch. Um, it, it goes ahead to say that he was characterized by two, two things. Um, one of them, of course, was the punctuality. Remember when he was in the Anglican church, because he was also, he, he, was, he had already built that skill set. The second thing um, was, of course, his... Um, Another thing was here, he actually started every time he slept. He always said that he always had, um, he always had encounters and he had vis- he always had um, visions. Also, he had revelations and dreams. So those were the two qualities that were, that were um, um, uh, Daniel was, was known for while he was um, with the church. At least that's what it says at this point. Then it, the book goes ahead to talk about the divine visitation which he, that he had. Um, one day he was, of course, he was heading the mission. He was heading, um, I think it's the maternity home. And one day when he was making an arrangement, I think somebody came to him, an angel came to him and said that, oh, you're going to be having three guests. So clean, get the place clean. So he was, he was said to have been cleaning up the place because of course it was said that um, um, when where where people are, where message was, okay, this was to be part of the message that his expected visitors were coming to give him, holiness unto the Lord. Erika was now in the state of animation and expectancy. He was excited, joyful. So basically what I'm trying to say here is he was basically excited about the guests and he was trying to get the place clean for the guests that were going to come. Um, the book goes ahead to say how three people came that looked um, <laughs> that looked different, that they were clearly look, looked um, looked different. Even a record that was expecting the guests, he got he got scared when he saw them, and he as he got um, he, he he got destabilized. He was now he was now he was what is it? He was like he lost his composure and emotional stability. 
that even the angels that came to deliver the message, they now had to hide themselves. They suddenly became invisible, but they continued talking, right? I continued talking and gave him the message. I think they basically had um, to, a couple of things to say. Um, do you want to go, I'll go ahead and Roberta, do you want to go ahead and talk about what things they have to say to Rekha? Okay, just um, because this is where, you know, as I say, the plot begins to thicken, thicken. but exactly. it is not the thickest part of the plot. It's just where it really starts to thicken. So I want to just slow down a little bit so that our listeners can really get the gist of what happened. Before this encounter that he had, we're told about his reputation. You know, in the beginning, I took time to describe what his physical appearance was and the fact that he was uneducated and how he came to Lagos, how he found uh, Faith Tabernacle. Eventually, he was now living with the pastor of Faith Tabernacle, Pastor Odu, let me, let me just get Odu his name. Uh, David Odubanjo. Now, I just want to highlight this. Yes, David Odubanjo. I want to highlight this because I, I saw it and I thought, ooh, interesting. One of them, um, so while he was living the house of Pastor David Odubanjo, the head of the Faith Tabernacle in Lagos, he met with young ladies and men living with the pastor. So this pastor had his house, he really was a pastor, you know, mm. by that I mean he had the pastoral grace, he had people all around. And I guess really at that time as well, they all supported each other so much. Everybody supported um each other so uh, the pastor had all kinds of people living in his home and uh one of the persons that was a member of the choir at the time was a lady by the name of hannah didiolu and hannah didiolu was who later became the wife of the famous politician and statesman guess who chief obafemi awolowo mm -hmm. and i was like interesting aha you know so now you know that Chief Obafemi Awolowo's wife, she was a member of the Faith Tabernacle mm -hmm. Movement and she was a, as they called it back then, a chorister. You know, they, she crossed path with Daniel Orekoya. So I, 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 and that prompts me to wonder to what degree, the book doesn't say to us, to what degree did they have influence with, um, with this, uh, with her husband's, work as a politician or at even at, you know, um, husband's work as a politician, what influence did they have access? Did they speak to him? Was he even one of them? Did he, was he open to their movement at all? You know, I don't know at what point she got married to him. And I'm, you know, and I know that from the book that Daniel didn't live long, but I'm just asking about the movement itself. What influence were they able to wield with um, politics and politicians and leadership and governance, nationhood. So that's what happened. Then he, we're told that Orekoya had a good reputation and was considered honest by even the leadership of the faith tabernacle. Way back then when they said somebody is honest, the person was honest through and through. It's not their co-workers who say honest, their, their family members will be like, ha! You haven't met, is that the front seat? Oh no, there are church members who say it's honest, but other people are saying, is that the, what he shows you guys? Well, let me tell you the truth. Let me tell you what he showed. No, it wasn't that way. They were transparent through and through. They were singular. Honest is honest. At home, at church, at work, they live their life in, in, in such a way. So because of, you know, they noticed all of these, he had so many great qualities. He seemed to really be in command of himself. He was well-disciplined. He was able to lead. He was allowed to lead some church activities and church events when the pastor wasn't around. I think this was way back before he even came to, to, yeah, um, to Lagos. They would let him lead some um, services, maybe some of the evening services, because he just showed a general command. You know, he can he was able to get the people's attention it's not everybody that's give, given to so irrespective of education daniel Rekoya had already had the makings of a preacher of a minister in him and he had been appointed as the head of a maternity maternity uh, mother care ward and you know they didn't believe in 
medication. Medicine. So I don't know why they built a hospital and maternity. Yeah, they didn't believe in that. So his job was part of his job was to pray for the people to have natural births and to be healed. It was a healing center, a miracle center, uh, mm. you know, because they didn't they didn't believe. It was while he was doing his duty that he had an encounter where he was told, prepare, you're going to have visitors. Mm -hmm. And he decided to prepare, clean. If I'm going to have um, spiritual visitors, I have to be clean. I have to be tidy. And it was in the middle of preparing when the visitors arrived. Lo and behold, mm -hmm. visitors were quite frightful to him because they were angelic beings. That was his first encounter. And, you know, they had to recall themselves because the tension was too much, too much for him. And that's when they brought him the message. Now, okay, now I'll leave you Uju to highlight the message that they brought for, for him. And then Ugo will tell us about what happened after that message. Where did, what was the trajectory of his life and ministry after that message? Okay, all right. So when they came, basically, um, I don't, let me not read, but let me just summarize. So basically the message spoke about holiness, right? Um, spoke about the holiness and um, they set the Lord's table in his proper place and everything around the altar in their divine arrangement. So they, so basically that was the basic thing they talked about. Then they also went about, went ahead um, to say um, some of the things that were hindering the church, right? They called out three things. They said the church was quenching the spirit, said the church was, um, was they said there was tinginess. And they talked about adultery and all manner of disobedience and vanities among the young ladies, such as excessive use of ornaments, jewelries, and other accessories. And I would think that at that time, really, this would have been part of the, the norm. Because, you know, at that, at that time, where there was traditional, where there was a lot of traditional um, rulership, you know, those are part of all those chants. So that would probably have been the norm for them. So I'm sure that, that those kind of things would be regular in the church. So these were the um, key things. Um, that the message was what, what, that came to Raphael was, yeah. And he said that if the church will take all these things from their midst, the revival, so they've clearly been praying for a revival because he said, they said, they said if they take all these things, the revival which they had been seeking and praying for will come, all right? And they also added a note of warning saying that if they fail to repent and judge themselves, then judgment will come leading to the loss of life. So that was the message that was sent to um given to a require for the church. And if they better, they also said that they were actually happy with the faith tabernacle, right? So I just, I just remember that when I was reading because the, the, the messenger said they were happy, God was happy with the faith tabernacle. That just, for me, when I was writing, I was just taking notes and I was just saying that at every point in time, you cannot put God in a box or you cannot just stay in your comfort zone and think that, yes, I have arrived. You need to be willing to listen and be obedient to whatever it is God is calling you to because if God is saying, I'm happy with you, however, this is the next line of action. Um, your willingness or non-willingness of light will determine um, God's wrath or blessings upon you. Um, over to you, Go. Okay, so um, uh, before Daniel, Ugo right? chimes in, you know, uh, be before Ugo chimes in, you know what you said, Uju, sounds like uh, when you go into the book of Revelations, the letter to the churches, how, mm -hmm. you know, the spirit of God was giving these messages to the churches, to so the church in Laodicea, church in, mm -hmm. you know. Macedonia. You know, and some of the churches said, I, I see your work. You know, I just, mm -hmm. I, I see your work. I know that you have resisted the enemy, but, mm -hmm. but here's an area of improvement. Mm -hmm. Here is an area that you need to not relax. Mm -hmm. Here's an area that you need to strive mm -hmm. some more. I mean, there were some churches that it was praise and there's some churches that it, it wasn't so mm -hmm. good, but some churches he said, I recognize how you've worked hard. Well mm -hmm. done, you know, don't be weary in well-doing, but there's still so much more for you to mm -hmm. do. And I think that's a message that is relevant to us day mm -hmm. and every day, that when God brings us, you know, God celebrates our efforts, mm -hmm. our mm -hmm. worship, our devotion to him. And in celebrating it, he also knows that if we, um, what's that term? Um, relaxed on our oars or something mm -hmm. like that. yeah rest on your laurels rest on our you, you you sort of set yourself up for yes mm -hmm. you you set yourself up for for a down downfall because as long as we're on this earth we're never truly ever safe because we have not arrived there's no arrival mm -hmm. on this side of eternity mm -hmm. we arrive 
uh, our arrival is somebody said a friend of mine said to me once that you know how proverbs says that um Forgive me, I forget how it says this. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. wisdom. You know, so the beginning of wisdom is to fear God. And my friend said to me, he said, the end of wisdom is Jesus, is God himself. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow. You know, it's just our journey is towards the light, towards Jesus. Mm -hmm. We never rest. We never rest. We continue. That's why we get up every day. You study your Bible, you spend time with Jesus every single day because where you wrestle not mm -hmm. against flesh and blood. And as long as you're on the side of eternity, you're constantly contending against mm -hmm. something. And we must never mm -hmm. just let the enemy mm -hmm. jump in when we're rejoicing or when you know we've taken our eyes off the ball. All right, mm -hmm. um, Ugo. Um, so, so before I, I dive into that, um, you know, it's funny how the what is the immortals, when I call them immortals, I came to visit him, talk about holiness unto the Lord. And it's something we keep touting, we want to tout God because we all have a vision of God that's so decent and friendly. So in trying to make God seem friendlier, we forget that there's an ask. You know how God said to Abraham, walk before me and be holy. Other versions say, walk before me and be perfect or walk mm -hmm. before me and be blameless. So I feel as if uh, in, the, in, the, in the mission to make God seem more approachable, we forget that part of him, that the holiness is a requirement to even have access to certain um, dimensions of, of who God is. But I was digressing. So what happens after he got the message? No, no, no. Hold on, hold on, uh, hold on. Um, that that was a good digress because yeah. when you see, when you read through the book, one of the things that strikes me so much is how those early people, when God gives them a message, holiness and purity, consecration is always yeah. very important mm. for. <clears throat> for who they become or what the work that they would yeah. do. And so they yeah. had their own way that they, they had ways in, that they expressed it. Some people was no ornaments, mm -hmm. no earrings, no makeup, no excesses, mm -hmm. your skirts, your dresses, it, you know, your dressing was a certain way. There was some kind of conformity. You looked, there was a description, a physical and outward description of what the spirit of God was communicating to them. Um, that their heart would be but it's it's something that i don't know how do we approach it today where is the place of that kind of message is it no longer relevant has it served its purpose or is mm -hmm. it taking on a different form and shape or are we just playing out ignoring the message of it's, that's the unpalatable um, sanctification that's purification the unpalatable holiness yeah, yeah. Mm. And God won't cast his prayer. But what does that look like for us today? It's in the choices you make um, when you're torn between telling the truth and telling a lie. You're telling the truth because you defer to God. You're more afraid of God. And fear of God is not fear of God. Fear of God is being, fear of being away from God. And as you know him and love him, or you're afraid of being away from him. And because you know he, he doesn't like sin, you're like, oh, this is my friend. I'm not going to do this because, because of my relationship with God. So that's where God wants us to get to the point where we love him so much that we we'll obey him, not out of fear, but out of a reverential fear, because you, God wants to put some respect on his name. As much as he's saying, call me our father, you gotta put some respect on his name. You know what I mean? So it's acting every day out of reverential fear and love for God. Remember when he said to Moses, um, this is holy ground, but take off your, sh take off your shoes because I am God. So, you know, as much as he wants us to come and hug him, but there's some protocols for access because he is, he is God. You know what I mean? Yeah. So the holiness message, is, he hasn't stopped. They told him to him now, God is saying to us again, be ye holy as I am holy. And as Tommy around me says, image is everything. Um, do you look like him? You know what I mean? So, so I will, after that, um, I reckon I had the task to deliver the message to the church. Now, this is before yeah. the time of for the advent of YouTube and Instagram and Reels. So you'll literally have to go there physically to church by church to deliver this message. And you'll think it wasn't a problem because I mean, he's, he's a well-respected member of the Faith Tabernacle, he's yeah. a sexton. So he goes to them and he says to them, he has this message, you know, certainly for him, he thought, okay, I'm part of the church already. I'm not a strange fellow walking in. He's an elder in the church and the Faith, it's not really a church, in the Faith Tabernacle is a, a movement. 
and his spiritual standing and pedigree, we're not in doubt. I mean, he's always been punctual. So he thinks, okay, this is going to be a breeze. I have a message mm -hmm. from God and they will, they'll give him their blessing and he'll go on to deliver the message. But alas, it, it didn't happen the way he planned. It was a case of what he ordered versus what he got. <laughs> so um, the first of article head of his which we he was again, and he said no. And he came to them and said, "This is what I'm hearing, and I have to go to other branches to deliver it." And to surprise, they said no. And they had a, they had a few good reasons. One, he couldn't read; the, he could only read the Bible. He couldn't read any other book. Number two, he wasn't so fluent in reading. Number three, he was partially impaired in one eye. So just imagine the vis the visual. And why we're a very visual society. When God said, um, God doesn't see as man sees. That means God knew that man sees. So we're very visual. So they're like this one going around to represent us. It doesn't look hard. How does it look? It doesn't look as good as it could look. Then he's, even though he was aged, he's, he was like, uh, he looked like a 12 year old boy. So, just for that um, um, view of this natural shortcomings, and because he had never preached in front of the congregation beyond that small community, they said no. So, he went on to, he went on without their blessings. And even as he went, um, God honored this move by blessing with a mighty revival, affirming the fact that God can, that no one can counter command the Lord's commandment. That's how it went. And, and as, as he went on, he met Baba Lala, he raised Baba Lala, and partnered with him. And this is where the book talks about as, how important association is. Who are you yoked with? When Saul was in the company of prophets, he prophesied. So it's important to be careful as you go on, on your work with God, who you hang out with. Let me, stop you. With Let me just stop you there. Um, because I want to talk about, I just want us to look at compare. Because we've looked at the story of Sophie, Mm -hmm. We've looked at the story of Sophie, an 18-year-old. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah. I can hear you. Okay, great. We've looked at the story of Sophie, an 18-year-old who gets a message from God and tells her father and tells the church, uh, tells the vicar, the catechist, um, vicar of the church, and he gives her an audience. Now we're looking at the story of Daniel, who the book, the church recognizes, this is a man of repute. They didn't doubt the efficacy of his word, of the message that he brought. They were not in doubt that that was a God word, but their concern was, you're not very eloquent. You're not educated. We can't have you represent our church. You, mm. you don't speak well, you don't look the part. I mean, you're partially blind and you're not really good looking. You know, I don't want to say ugly, but, you know, he didn't maybe dress well, dress the part. It wasn't well packaged. So they said, no. What I find interesting is it didn't seem, there's no evidence that they suggested a solution. Okay, we've heard this word. This is God's word. We really don't think you should. Let's, how can we best present this word? Because people need to hear this word. No, no, no. They didn't do that. They just locked down the word. And he felt the fire so much. He felt like I've been given this word. I've been given a responsibility. If they won't let me, if they won't take it, then I will go with this message and I would, um, I would give the message. And so that's how he, against the, uh, against the church, he moved out. I don't think he didn't actually intend to leave the church. He just went on a missionary journey. So to speak, yeah. let's call it the first missionary journey. And this first missionary journey is what made him Daniel or, or the Orekoya that we know of today because, wow, that was so unexpected what had um, happened to him. So, um, Ugo, I'll let you continue on that. Where were the important, where did he go to before he met Babalola? Was his destination Babalola? Where was, when he left Lagos, what was his intention? Um, so let me just go through that piece. He went, he actually went straight to join Babalala at Elisha. That's he went there straight. He didn't, he didn't um, stop anywhere else. No I think he, make, he makes reference to him having heard about the revival with Babalala. So that's why he so was he joined him to, yeah, joined Babalala at Elisha. And, um, okay. and, and, and as, as, the, as news went around, the crowd started to gather at the, for the great revival that erupted at Elisha. So people started to trip to Elisha. Um, news reports, eyewitnesses and others have traveled around the nation. So everybody heard about the revival that was going on at Elisha. Um, so that, well, he said it was the news of Elisha. Yeah, so there was the revival that led him to Elisha, then he met Baba Lola there. So he had, he had heard of Elisha, he had heard of what Baba Lola was doing. So he went there. Mm, yeah, so, so 
Now, this revival, the 1913, 1912, 1913, I think, revival, I, I wonder if, I, I hope, I believe there would be some work that has been done about that revival because it's so important to the religious atmosphere in Nigeria. That's another one. That revival, the key actors in that revival, Babalola, of course, I think he was um, one of the first, he had started, the revival had started under his own ministry. Then when Daniel came and met him, he took a part of that revival and spread it. He took it. Babalola had been having series of revival meetings, revival meetings, and people were coming, getting saved, abandoning their fetishes and just abandoning their God. People were encountering God. Healings were happening. The crowd was coming because Jesus was pulling them. The spirit, it's nothing like that had happened. They hadn't experienced much of that in Elisha. So, wow. but a lot, um, or record, I hadn't heard, I haven't heard this. This sounded okay. Let me go and explore this. Let me see what's happening. Would they accept me? Would they hear this message? And he and he set out, but he made a stopover in Ibadan. He did. Uh, he made a stopover in Ibadan on his way, and um, eventually he arrived in Lesha and proceeded to Oko. Okay, oh yeah, please forgive me the site of the revival. By this time, the revival had shifted from Faith Tabernacle Church to Open Fields Revival. As soon as Apostle Baba Lola sighted Orekoya from a distance, they'd never met before. They had never met before. As soon as uh, Baba Lola sighted Orekoya from a distance, he called out to him to come wow. and join him on stage. Wow. Yep. You know, it was like spirit calling out to see, you know, the spirit of God just bore witness, that man. Yeah. 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 You know, so uh, Rekaya joined him on stage. He was just, he was really thrown to the deep end because he, he hadn't had any of these experiences before. He was just a man with a message, had left his church, well, against the, uh, against, without the permission or blessing of his church, he was going to just deliver a simple message around. And here he finds yeah. himself in the middle of, of a revival. Revival, a notable, the, I don't know if there's been any other revival quite like, like that one wow. since then. And this is what happened. I know that during the revival, um, things happened with him. He was, he saw himself perform miracles. Where are some of the miracles that he performed in Babalola's revival? And then it says that Babalola at, at some point, left the revival to go and do something else and left it under the care of a record. Isn't that quite interesting? Wow. Somebody who wow. met two seconds ago, what gives you the wow. current ministry this in his hands and, and go away? And what were some of the wow. things that happened? Any one of you wants to jump in here? I think we'll have been dead. Would you go ahead? Yeah. No, I was going to talk about that lady that had been dead for three days. Pregnant. The, Alice Abio, Alice Abio lady. I think that was one of the, I think that was one of the biggest things of uh, Orokaya's revival. The lady that- no, but before, we get to, before we get to that juicy part, we want to talk about Orokaya <laughs> and Onda <laughs> Baba <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, Was it the three women who asked him to pray for them? The woman, he told his host that three women would come to meet him to pray for them. And truth is what three women came and asked for prayers. Hmm. Was it those? Was it that one? Because that happened as well. Okay, I'll read, I'll read, I'll just read an excerpt uh, from the book to just help us. So yeah. Orekoya arrived in Ibadan on the 5th of September by rail. He was reported mm -hmm. to be praying for people in the rail until he arrived in Ibadan. No, no, no. Um, I think it's page 387, 386, 387, except then. No, no, I think I've jumped on. Okay, okay, in the present, okay. Um, Mama. 
So in late August 1930, Babalola, after staying for several weeks in Elisha, took the revival to his hometown. This was the same time where they had rejected him. And if you have read the Babalola story, you would, you would know it. So I'll, I'll, I'll skip all of that. The crowds were still coming to him because he had, uh, it had, um, mm. Babalola had gotten an invite from somebody. And so he suddenly, he left in, at the dawn of day to, re, uh, to respond to that invite. People didn't know that Babala was not around mm -hmm. because miracles were still happening on the campground. And it was Daniel Orokoya that was now in charge. He was at the center of these revivals. And I think this was where God really showed him what could happen. I thought that was just, that was really a move of God. He came under the anointing of somebody else and then God pulled the person away, still under that same uh, anointing so he can see what was possible. And when all this happened, I believe he stirred up some measure of courage in his heart that he too could do. In fact, people just knew him. He was registered. The man was at that revival. He prayed for people. So when he got on the train to make his journey back, he wanted to stop in a few places. People were accosting him on the train and he, was, he had to be praying for people on the train on his, on his way. And so that's where we mm -hmm. have the Orekoya arrived in Badon on the 5th of September by rail. He was reported to be praying for people in the in the rail until he arrived in Badon. He went straight to Okebola, where he met MG Akpata, the same person he met on his way to Elisha. He gave the elderly man a recap of what had happened at Elisha. Before he could settle down to eat, he told his host that some women would soon come to look for him. So he had an um, insight that people were coming to look for him. Not long after that, three women entered asking for him and requesting for prayer. Before he could finish eating, the number had increased to nine inside the parlor. This was how the Ibadan oh revival started. He had just come from Baba Lola's revival camp. He had gone to Ibadan. He was eating or trying to eat. It started with three women coming for prayer. Before he could finish his meal, nine people were there as he was praying. Voila, we have you a revival in, in Ibadan. This were the, uh, the, you know, Ibadan was very critical to that um, 1912, 1913 revival. And all of this happened in September, October. I think September, October, round about this time was the peak of that Ibadan revival. So the people from Ibadan, there's a blessing waiting for you. If you're from Ibadan and you're on this call, there is a revival calling your name to be rekindled once more. So I pray that that impartation and that unction will come, will come upon you tonight. So I'll read some more. So the next day, I know one of the leaders of the Faith Tabernacle in Ibadan took him to meet their leader, Pastor Akinyele, at his residence, who prayed together with a require for the progress of the revival work. So they quickly recognized that this was a new work, that God was doing something here, and they jumped on it. That's very laudable that they, they were able to discern God is doing something. They didn't fight it, but they banded together. We're going to steward this, the terminology we use today. We're going to steward this. We're going to encourage this. We're going to give it place to bloom. So um, people immediately, as he was around, people were recognizing him. He couldn't hide his identity anymore. You know, and people just came to him. Um, I think they they had a clash with Seventh Day Adventists. I think they were just causing it <laughs> at some point. But this clash made them to even get a bigger. They you know they they had to get a bigger ground. They were this was an on the revival happened on them. They didn't plan to have a revival. There wasn't any, yes. he hadn't been praying towards a revival or expecting a revival. This was just a man who got a message. His church rejected him, rejected him carrying the message. And he went on to, to, to take this message around. And so I had a thought and a question like, I mean, God in his wisdom, what if they had let him, what if the church had let him give that message in his church? Would these things have happened. Would he have seen the need to go to Baba Lola? Would he have, would this Ibadan revival have happened at all? Like really just what if, or was it all God's 
orchestration and design, did God purposely give him that particular message, make him that particular way, so that they will reject him as the, you know, so that he will be proper, he would encounter his real destiny. Like if you get what I'm trying to, what I'm yeah. really trying to communicate. What if they'd accepted him? Sometimes rejection is really what you need. A, a kick in the behind is, is what you need to, to come into mm -hmm. alignment with, yeah. with your spiritual calling or with your spiritual destiny. Yeah. Sometimes people, you know, we cry a lot about how they rejected me, they threw or me out. Shut doors. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the person that the person that misses out is the person that has rejected because God knows it's going to happen either which way. It's either yeah. you succumb by you be a part, a partaker of what God is doing. But all of them, the people of faith have could have rejected. They have a part of Ibadan could have happened through whoever was managing the branch in Ibadan. It could have been a move through faith tabernacle versus it going ahead and being there with Babalola. So at the end of the day, the person that suffers is the person that rejected because God's move is going to happen. Okay, that's a that's a that's another that's another angle. But my message in the in it really was that some we really should. The Bible says, "And everything give thanks," because we don't know what God is orchestrating behind the scenes for us, and we really just don't know. We don't know what God is working out. We have to learn yeah. to trust that trust. God works out everything for our wow, good. good. That every failure, okay. as I say, God doesn't waste anything, even your failures. He sees you've slipped, you fell, you've fallen. He likes mm -hmm. to take it and polish it and make it look as if yeah. uh, no plan, you know. And that's mm -hmm. just the beauty. There's nothing. There's nothing that goes to waste with Him. Yeah. He's a redeemer of the past. He's a redeemer of of the ugly. He really yeah. brings joy out of. You know, he turns mourning into, into, into dancing. God, I just want to just hammer on that of the faithfulness and the goodness and the nature of God. You can't yes. trust God and be disappointed. You can't, you can't walk with him in obedience mm -hmm. and it works against you. That's, that's not the, God is ultimately mm -hmm. and infinitely good. Everything he does is designed it's good. to greatness and oh, to death. Okay. Sure. <laughs> Right, okay. So I want us to see some of the interesting stories of what happened in his Ibadan revival because there were quite phenomenal incidents that happened. Um, one of the most interesting one was, so as we stated, this revival that they didn't plan started and all kinds of things were happening unexpectedly. Of particular case was, uh, a particular case was a name, uh, was a case of a woman named Ajike um who protested the break of covenant and intimacy which had characterized their relationship oh right okay i the way the book is reading written sometimes you have to just take a breather and then interpret or um, give it more so this lady ajike mm -hmm. had come to the campground and encountered the lord then brought her yeah. charms and everything to burn mm -hmm. into the fire um would you do you want to just tell us what that encounter and perhaps just read some of the uh what's recorded about that mm. let me i'll just read from the second paragraph with many mighty with many mighty sort did heralding his ministry oraka became easily the most um let me see in particular the, 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 no you want to get the conversation yes yeah of particular interest was the case of a woman named that you can Who's Igbadi? Igbadi is a, a leathern girdle containing magic charms. Protested the sudden break of covenant and intimacy which had characterized their relationship before the revival. The dialogue went thus as the woman dropped this demonic item into the flame. Now it goes, Ajika, are you leaving me today? What have I done to you? On what occasion or errand have I failed you? Is this our agreement? Then Ajikena replies and says, the Lord has parted us company. Therefore, the agreement no longer holds. Now the demon responds saying, then bring my remaining kolobo. Kolobo is a clay receptacle in your possession. So for several days, this mysterious item was an object of attraction at the revival before it was finally destroyed. Yeah. 
Yeah, so you can imagine dumping something and some, suddenly the stuff is jumping up and down and, and, and having a conversation. It's even amazing that people sat around to watch it. I would have <laughs> taken off. Yeah. Yeah, that was, that was a very unique and interesting story. And as you read it, I just wanted to just bring our attention to, to the conversation again, most importantly, mm -hmm. to Adjia's response to this demonic yeah. entity. You know, she says, the Lord has parted us company. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the agreement no longer. No longer. <laughs> and guys, I just feel this, wow, what a revelation she had. Mm -hmm. Her response to the enemy and the attack is, you know, yeah, I know we had an agreement before, but there is a greater power at work within me. And therefore I cannot honor the agreement. The agreement we had yeah. is dissolved, you know? That's just so powerful because it's a truth of the Bible that when we come to the Lord, every agreement, the Bible says that the every handwriting of ordinance that was written against us, he has wiped it away is literally through the blood, wiped it away. It no longer exists. That is the purpose of the cross. That is the purpose of Jesus's death, burial and resurrection. That everything, every of the former thing, we're no longer, you know, we're new creations. We are under new covenants. God said it even in the Old Testament, a new law I would write in their heart. And God has written for every believer, a new law, a new agreement um, in our hearts. So we don't need to, we're under no obligation. We have nothing to do with the old covenant, much less, much less covenant that we made with the power of darkness. When you come to Christ, they have no hold. They have no say in your life because Jesus, as we sing that song, who has the final say? Jehovah has a final Jehovah. say, and Jehovah has given his word concerning our life. And I, I say this because sometimes we really struggle. We struggle and we find repetitive cycles in our lives. We, we struggle finding ourselves struggling to move forward, break habits, break um, yeah. addictions, um, even enter into some of the promises of God. And we don't know why. We wonder if there's any additional thing we need to do. The only thing you need to do, really, the main thing you need to do is believe that the blood of Jesus is enough, that the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus is enough, that there's no other voice needs to be spoken, no other sacrifice needs to be made, no other petition needs to be made. We need to just come under the blood of Jesus, come under the finished work of Jesus, and say to the devil, like Ajike said, the Lord has please. The Lord has parted us. You know, our agreement no longer holds. So if you have a problem, I suggest you take it to the authority that I am now in a new <laughs> agreement. I'm now in a new agreement with. Your fight is not with me. So go fight mm -hmm. with God if you must pick a fight. So I wanted to just say, um, say that. So thank you for that. Now let's go on to some of the other interesting um interesting stories that happened yeah. so so i'll just read to you here so we're told that in the weeks of in the weeks of september 4th to september 27th and then september 28th to october 4th the number of sick people who had come to the revival to testify this is the number of recorded testimonies healing testimonies was 2,200 without counting those who for shyness could not go to testify. Then um, we're also told that the people brought water to the revival ground, which he prayed on. You know, it is the people themselves who fetch the water for themselves and each person carries his or her water before the prophet. And he does not pray on each person's water separately rather he prayed, he did a general preaching and he will sing and he will pray and all those aff afflicted with various disease, sicknesses and diseases um, simultaneously. Then the moment he begins his prayer, everyone will carry their water vessels with them and shout amen at the, at the end of the prayer. When he wanted to round up his preaching, 
he would teach them a verse from the word of God. And this is what he would always teach them. Lord, heal me and I'll be healed. Lord, save me and I will be saved. I read this. Amen. Amen. This is so, like the word of God just never ages. This is so relevant today. This is a prayer that we need to pray today, every day. Heal me and I'll be healed. I think there's a song about that. Heal me, oh Lord, and I will be healed. It's actually a Bible verse um, in Jeremiah. Jeremiah, yeah. And, and one thing that was interesting about it is that he drew their attention by this prayer. He drew their attention to the fact that God is the one healing them and saving, saving them. Mm -hmm. That's one thing I found interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's flip on to, to the story of Alice, the woman, um, I think Ujo or is it Ugo, who was it that wanted to jump into this story? Now is your chance. We can talk about this is another interesting very, I think, maybe one of the highlights of his ministry. Um, this lady, we'll just Alice, go for it. <laughs> this lady, Alice, had died at night. I would like us to read. She had died at night. Okay, it's page three, three eight eight and three eight nine. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I can, I can read it. You want me to read it? Yes, I would like you to read read her account. And this is her own account because years later they found the woman and they started making her come to the church anniversary or the ministry's revival anniversary to testify of what had happened in her. So she had died on the 9th of September 10th, 1930. Oh, sorry, the revival was 1930, not, not, not 1912. With a pregnant, she was pregnant at the time. I think she was about five, six months pregnant, and she had died of a mystical bullet fired at her by wicked forces. And it was a practice in those days that certain rituals had to be performed on a pregnant woman, when a pregnant woman, if she died before she could be buried. Her husband mm. couldn't, I mean, you know, those things are really tasking. Her husband couldn't really afford it, you know, but he took her to the campground not for healing, but he took her so they can break the cycle. It, it was believed that if a woman died in um, while pregnant, a curse was on the family and the thing, it will continue to repeat itself. So he wanted to just go and break that curse so it would never happen to them again. That's why he went to the campground carrying her dead body. So she had died on the 9th of the 10th. By the time they got to the campground, it was the third or fourth day and she was already beginning to smell as you would imagine. So would you just care to read the story of her and her, her account of what had happened? Yeah. So I'll read, I'll read the account of uh, Madam Alice Abiu. So she yes. says, the moment they began to speak that she is dead, I also began to see my own corpse on the ground like a shadow of my real self. All the arrangements they were making to get a vehicle to convey my body to Ibadan. I was seen and hearing. Then they oh. brought the vehicle and put my corpse inside to begin to go to Ibado. The surprising thing to me, however, was that rather than board the vehicle with them, I found myself in front of the vehicle with being carried by a strong wind. Going in front of them, in spite of the speed of the vehicle, it could not catch up with me. The second thing that surprised me was that I arrived at a Kubala ahead of those conveying the cops, despite the fact that no one described the place to my spirit, to my spirit body. Not long after I arrived there, the vehicle conveying my cops came. I heard people saying, they have brought the cops. I don't understand this, but I saw that they took my cops to the prophet, that is Daniel Rekoya, where he was. I have to be distant to the cops because it was already smelling to me. And I was watching what the prophet will do because it was like my shadow. I saw the prophet pouring water from his bell into the body of the corpse laid down. The wonder of it was that as he was pouring the water on the corpse, so the water was pouring on me too, where I was, as far as I was to them. And the prophet was ringing his bell on the corpse. All these I was seeing where I, that is my spirit was standing. The greatest thing was that whenever the, the prophet rang the bell, 
the sound was like that of mighty thunder and I was shivering with fear where I was. This was how the prophet was doing intermittently. Suddenly, I saw a man standing behind me. He was so tall that I did not see the face and could not refuse his command. It was this man who commanded me where I was that I should move near the cops and put it back on as my cloth, no matter the smell. A force began to move me nearer and nearer my cups where it was placed with the prophet. This tall man also commanded me in a loud voice like thunder in my ears, saying I should put my hand to the hand of the cups. And it was compulsory, I had to obey. The wonder of it was this. The moment I put my hand into the hand of the cups, people shouted saying, ha, the hand is shaking. Even though I was seeing them, that is my spirit body, but they weren't seeing me and everything they, was, they were saying, I was hearing. Again, the man asked me to put my legs into the legs of the cops, just like you're wearing a trouser and I obeyed. Again, I heard the shout of the people saying, see, the legs are shaking. Yet I don't understand all that was happening. I was just hearing the noise. The man also asked me to put my head to where the head of the cops was, just like someone is trying to wear a cap. I could not refuse in spite of terrible smell. Then I heard the noise. She is risen. She has opened her eyes and shaken her head. This was how I met myself lying down in front of a great crowd. And it was like a dream to me. Then the prophet lifted me up with his hand. Songs of hallelujah and praise filled the air before I was taken to a house for proper care. This was how I became whole again and returned to the world. The greatest wonder of it all was that I gave birth to my child and the child was alive despite the fact wow. that I was dead for four days wow. from the 9th to the 12th of September, 1930. Wow. Yeah. Of course, it goes ahead to say wow. that after this, the woman's account is ended, but it goes ahead to say that after three days, the woman began to re regain her full strength and three months later, she gave birth to her child safe and sound and she testified mm. before the crowd what God had done for her. But he says that the child grew up to be a normal and healthy woman and is still living at the time of the writing of this. Praise wow. the Lord. Praise the Lord. <laughs> I know. I, when I read that account, I'm like, Jesus, you deserve a standing ovation. I, mean, I just I pause, stand up and say, well done. Well done. <laughs> well done. Yes, you Lord. outdid yourself with this yes, one. Lord. You know, when the Bible talks about, you know, greater works than this, you would do. You would I do. always talk with that scripture. I'm like, Jesus, I don't know. I know you said it. And I, because you said it is the truth. I, mm. But I'm, str I'm struggling to see how we will ever be able to do even as much as you did. Wow. But this is working through yeah. Daniel Orekoya, raising someone who had been dead for four years with a pregnancy. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. wow. What more can we say? Yes, sir. Really, what more can we say? So um, that's one of the most, um, one of the highlights of his ministry. Yeah. He raised many other dead. He healed all mm -hmm. kinds of diseases, their accounts. One thing is, again, we note about the um, Orekoya and Babalola, more of Orekoya is told, is that the news carried it, the, the newspaper, um, publication yeah. houses actually carried these stories so they were very very they were very much verifiable they were, they were fact he, he goes into some extent the, the writer goes into some extent mm -hmm. just telling us that look they're facts to back these stories this unseeming stories of these things really did happen and i'm gonna just make a a big leap into um into his the into the pause before his second missionary journey. So after Ibadan, he went in, he went to Abiokuta. He was he had actually been invited by the by the local Alake. chief Alake. Yes, and they, they set up yes they set up a campground for him, and he just began to you know another revival started in Abiokuta, and people came from everywhere. There's this man that we're told who came all the way from Benin Republic 
to, I think his name is Joshua. He came all the way from Benin Republic to be part of this revival. And this man later ended up being, just caught something. He caught a fire that he took back to Benin Republic. He brought a group of people together and they started to pray. When they started, there were so many, everybody was excited, but they couldn't keep up. Other people couldn't keep up with the fervency and they whittled down to the few that God would eventually use to change the spiritual topography of Benin. Mm -hmm. But after Abiyokuta, he goes home to, he returns to, he returns home to Lagos, to his church. Now, one thing we didn't mention earlier is that uh, Orakaya was married, not by choice really, but as a, he was, as a result of a tradition, his older brother had died who was married had died, leaving a wife without a child. And they had a custom that you keep the woman in the family. So it was up to him to step up and marry her to keep her in the family. He resisted it because he didn't want to. He wasn't interested. Something in him just rebelled against it. But he submitted that to, after mounting pressures from his family, he submitted it to his church authority to say, what should I do about this? The church authority looked at the case and said, well, it seems good. She's a woman, you're a man. She seems all right. You have a duty to perform. You can't exactly kick her out. So go and marry her. And he did. That he did. That was just such a big disaster. It was such a big disaster because as soon as the deed was done, that was it. We're told that they never consummated the marriage. He just kept her in the house. He wouldn't go near her. And she was the woman scorned. Hallelujah, all the women out there. <laughs> Hell has no fury like a woman scorned. She was a, a woman scorned. So it was constant. He was in discomfort. He was in discomfort. She made a, a duty to report him all the time to the church authority. And the church mm -hmm. was constantly trying to intervene. He was not interested in settling this matter because there was no settlement. He, there, was no, there was no settlement about this. It just things were going to be the way they are. There's nothing we can, we can do about it. Then he gets this, at the same time, he gets this invitation from this lady in, uh, where was she in Worry? Yes, yeah, she, invitation. Worry. Yes. This lady had attended one of his crusades and thought, wow, we need this in Worry. Please come. Worry people need you. Come to us. He told the church and the church says, you can't go because you need to settle, you have problems at home. He had fallen out with the church, he had fallen out with his wife, the church was not happy with his home situation. They told him, you can't go, you have problems, don't go. But he defied that. And you know, when I say that, it kind of just reminds me of, um, of Samson in a way. He just defied that and said, I'll go out like I did once, uh, I, I did before. Maybe full confidence that all these things that's happening to him, all the power that's been displayed, it will, it will happen again. And he goes to worry. That was such an unfortunate trip because he never made it. He made it back from worry, but that was the end of his life. The way that, you know, how many, how many, how many, was he, I think they'd started the crusades and one of the nights of the you know, days of the crusades, yeah. he met, I'll just let you go. Let me let you chime in here and tell us the worry experience. Look, I'm still, just can, can you circle back to me, please? I'm looking for it. Okay, would you? So I think he had gone to, um, the, he had gone to worry, and I think one of the nights of the say they were trying to light a lamp, a, a lamp, a gas lamp, and there happened to be a, a, a gallon of oil by the side. Sorry, one of the workers, was somebody was trying to do it, and he told the person, bring it to me, let me try and sort it out. And in the process, there's an explosion and the foil by the side also explodes. So he is engulfed in, in flame. The book records that he's engulfed in flame. The other people that are in the room are not even engulfed. So he's burning um, from head to toe, right? So it, um, it was just such a, it was such a, a sad, sad story. Yeah. Tragic end. A tragic end. And he's engulfed in, in flame. So they, they try to they quench it a lot, but I think it's, it's already a first degree born. It's the, 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 it's a first degree born. Then at that point, he's actually asking for to take for them to take him back home. I think he already knows it is the end. So he's saying he wants to go back home. 
And you know, at that point, um, I, Babalola was in Ilesha, Ilesha, which I believe is closer to, was closer to worry. So it's even mentioned that, oh, he, they didn't even think of taking him back to, taking him to Ilesha for perhaps for prayers. But they send him back, they take him back to his um, original base. I think that's Jebodio or, or Lagos, I'm not sure anymore. But I know Sophia happened, Sophie happened to be there because they, they, they go into prayers for him at Faith Tabernacle. Um, because of course, they don't use any medication with Faith Tabernacle. So they go into prayers for him. And he's in anguish where he actually records and he starts, he's reminiscing on his life and he's saying, making reference to perhaps his pride, perhaps his disobedience, perhaps those are the things that brought about his downfall um, at the end of his life. So he's, he's, he's um, making reference to all those things, of course, his repentance. Um, yeah. So he just reads and says, he made public open confessions of his sin of pride, arrogance, self-willedness, willedness disobedience and insubordination to the church authority, which according to him was responsible for his tragedy. Yeah, he warned others not to follow his step. This was his confession and cry as he screamed and groaned in pain until he finally rested in the Lord. And of course, it goes ahead. this was in Ijebode. It goes ahead to say how he was buried um, in Ijebode. Yeah, that was the end of... Um, okay. Ugo, are you ready to come on now and uh, uh, you know, and this end really got me emotional because just in, it, it was indeed such a tragic end. That, that was it. He just died, just like that. And you, you wonder why didn't he ask to be taken to Babalala? Because that was his, uh, that was his associate, that was his friend. I mean, I mean, that worked together. But I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. What, I, I, and you see this end, this similar end to other people who have done such amazing things for God. And you wonder what happened at that point. What happens? Do you stop thinking, or, or do you just? give up or are you like this is god's will i don't know it's a very emotional end to baba Lala, to um Marekoya's life imagine i i think of I, I think of one of the things that i think of is imagine being the lady that invited him to worry imagine the people of worry how they will feel that yeah. this great renowned man of god who has sparked fires comes to your hometown and mm. meet an untimely death. May that never be our portion in Jesus' name. Like, Amen. Amen. like may that never, ever, ever be that where we are for signs and for wonders. We, we are mm. for expansion of the gospel and the kingdom, not, mm. not where people have to meet such a horrible and nasty end. This was in March of 1931. Remember this revival, the peak of his revival was in September, October, 1930. So this is... Yeah. You know, yeah, yes, really. Um, where he encountered this, like somebody was already was fixing, was trying to light the lamb. You know, they had the yeah. it was kerosene lamps they had back then, or it was kerosene of petrol lamp, and yeah. they were unsuccessful, and they decided to take it to him. I just wonder, this is your guest minister. This is your guest preacher. It's not even a local. You know, he's not yeah. a local. Was he a, a, a specialist in lighting lamps that it was taken to him? I, just, I, look at, I look at everything that happened around that and I, I, and I question all the, I question all the elements, all the parts, all the activities, the decisions that were taken. It was very innocent, of course, nobody designed for any of this to happen to him. And he, in trying to, he in trying to help to light this lamp, unbeknownst to him, or maybe we don't know whether the, the gallon of petrol was already there or it was brought there, or we don't know what it was. We just don't know. What we do know is that this lamb, he was engulfed in flames and there was no coming back from that. There was oh, just yes. coming back. And you know the irony of it, he didn't believe, they didn't believe in hospitals and medicine and doctors. So they couldn't have gotten any of that kind of help. I mean, he was first degree burns. This is life claims. He wasn't going to come out. He wasn't going to come out hale and hearty from that yeah. experience. But then yeah. as Uju mentioned, you're, you're a faith healer. Your mm -hmm. counterpart Babalala isn't too far away. Why wasn't there any decision to go to one of those to go to that point, you know, did he resign himself to, this is my end? He was just 31, 31, 32. 
Wow. That that was that was just such a you know and and we talked about uh, when we're um, I think Ugo mentioned that sometimes people have people who have worked with God why do they end up with this sort of sad ending This is not how you yeah. end up you know such a sad ending like is God not paying attention Was God angry mm -hmm. with him What was happening My take on it was that it, it really is that. Sometimes we open the door. We are the ones that open the door for the enemy. Now, the Bible says that if you break the hedge, the serpent will bite, and he's ready to bite. I am a believer that the enemy does his work excellently well. He gets A plus, 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 plus from God for executing the mission that he was sent, um, the mission that he has against the children of the children of light. And so he's always prowling around like a lion, like a lion waiting for whom he would devour. And he just had a, he had some measure of legitimacy that hadn't been addressed. It could have been addressed, but it was overlooked. And in Orekoya's account himself, he says that he confessed to the sin of pride, pride being the reason that he had seen what God had done in his life. And I think he just got a bit too confident. He just got a bit too confident and thought he was immune to attacks or immune to challenges. This is referencing what we said earlier on about, you know, when God comes, he says, well done, you're doing well here, but don't rest. Don't get caught mm -hmm. up. Don't get carried away because the work is not yet done and your enemy really is still, is still around looking for how to attack you. Wow. That's that's what happened. He made a mistake in marrying this woman, yes. And he made that mistake more so because the church encouraged him and advised the people he looked up to. But I think the situation was still redeemable. If he had been more cautious in not going out for this revival without settling some of the misunderstanding with his, your church was angry with you, your wife is angry with you, and you set off on a revival. That wasn't the wisdom mm -hmm. at all. And that's something that we need to learn. The importance of addressing things, addressing issues that are open so that you do not give the devil a foothold or a chance. So I think this is where we really come to an end with this conversation. But as I round up, do you have any final thoughts, any final words? Does anybody have any questions? I've read your comments and uh, I've read your comments in the chat, specifically relating to Sophie. I have not seen any comments relating to, to Daniel or Rekoya. If you have any thoughts, any comments, you can just put it in the chat just as we round up. So would you, I'll let you go, any last, Final words. Well, for me, I think the I, I, I took some things from both people. I think one of them, Goma has written me very much to write, that all the great prophets or Bible characters or revivalists had um, had a heart for seeking God and they were jubilant, pining for God. I don't know how this is how I read it. I'm just reading that. That's one of the key things. But I think from the two people, from the two of them, I'll just add a couple of things. Work based on revelation, um, um, because you need you need that your work of faith. You need God to have told you this is this is um, what you're this is what you're hinged on. Um, God's will is, is his bill. When God sends, like in the two cases, when God sent the both of them, there was somebody waiting for them. So you can be sure that when God does send you, He has gone before you to make straight the crooked ways. Um, um, so God also equips you for your journey. You look at the two cases, somehow they've been in the missionary, they've been teaching. Um, so when the time came, they either could read the Bible, they could, um, they had jobs to get to. Um, okay, the BBC, they could attend so you can rest. Um, <laughs> then another thing I wrote was keep your gaze on Jesus. If you remember the story of Sophie, when the Agimo, that Agimo, she said, when she, she, Agimo was stopping, was, was meant to be stopping her from going into, going for fellowship. And she just, people were looking at her, there was another lady that they were thinking they would die. But nothing happened. So if anything, it was recorded that the, the Agimo was the one that didn't come back the next year. So it was like the same, it made reference to the story of, um, I think it was um, Paul in the Bible that when the snake, the viper beat his hand, everybody was thinking something happened to him, but he just shook it off. So keep your gaze on Jesus and you can be sure that all the, all the, all whatever it is will fall off. All the crosses or whatever it is will just fall off. Keep your gaze on Jesus. 
So for me, those were some of the things I, I got from it. I think one last thing from Morocco, I just stay sensitive to the moves of God. I think it's in line with the last thing we're saying. We need to stay sensitive. Don't put God in the box. Um, look at the people of faith, Tanabanako. They rejected the message because they were expecting, they wanted a particular format. The, the way they expected the record to be, he was not meeting that format, so they were not listening to what he had to say. Um, so we need to keep a, stay sensitive, understand the move of God. I think it's a representative of the season we are in now because so many things are happening now, right? Whether it's the COVID or whatever it is, we just need to stay sensitive and understand what God is doing at a time like this um, so that we just don't miss him. We don't know the form. It's not going to be the way we expect. Those are my learnings. I think it's quite a lot, but that, that's my learnings for me. Yeah. Thank you, Uju. So Uju, I said it all. But I'll say my major learnings were, were two. Was, um, both amazing stories, both amazing stories. Um, the first one is, um, oh no man, nothing but love. Um, when you meet people who have actually encountered God, you notice how tender their hearts are. You notice that's reminiscent of who the father is. You know, when Sophia said, Sophia, how Sophia showed them God as a very soft, gentle person. And you see, um, everybody you cross, cross paths with, you have a responsibility towards that person. So um, Arakoya didn't do right by the woman he married. Um, so it's, it's important to, when you're relating to people, to be very careful when you're dealing with people. Again, oh no man, nothing but love. Um, leave every man better than you left them. Be fair to them in their dealings. When Jesus said, um, turn their that church, he meant it. Be fair to people in your dealings with them. And secondly, walk circumspectly in this your God work. Um, focus on your audience of one. I don't think um, Arakaya's ending was, was because he, he, he flaunted the rules. Of the, he, he didn't do what the church wanted. I mean, the first time, the church asked him not to go, but, but there, there are reasons to the ministry official. Second time, who knows? But we, we won't know. It's per time. It's to look at God per time and ask him, what is the right thing to do in this circumstance every day? You know, the, 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 the biggest deterrent to the, to the new, new move of God is the old move of God. So every time, when they say never lose your wonder, it's every day you're looking at God and saying, what are we doing today? Like a child, what's going on today? What's going on today? What am I doing in this situation? Because yesterday's revelation will no longer work for today. So it, it's important to stay fresh, um, stay sensitive, never lose your wonder, walk carefully and circumspectly before God, with your face set as flint towards him, focusing your audience of one. That's my takeaway. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, ladies, for that uh, for that summary. So, this brings us to a close. I hope that you have taken away something something meaningful. Actually, so I, I don't think she's on the call anymore. Adenike A. She had put some notes. She had said that um, Sophie is living her life or lived her life. Um, let's see, how did she put it? I can't scroll on my phone. Sorry said uh, Sophie lived the life that she admires. Pardon? Yeah, let me read it. Let me read it for you. She yeah, said, yeah. Um, oh, where is it? Sophie, okay, because I, I had said at the time, Sophie lived my life. She now said Sophie lived her own life in the 1900s. So she said she, she could show that being Sophie. Yes. But she still yes. can be. <laughs> she would have. And then she says that um, um, Sophie, Sophie was born in the year her grandfather allegedly was born and died in the year he died. So she feels a kind of, thank you, Bolanle, a, a kind of connection between, and, and I just wanted to just release a word concerning that, that whatever connection you're feeling, I ask that the Lord would just multiply it and that you would not have a, I wish this was my life, but it will become your life to live. Just that extraordinary life. This is the, the, the days of the Deborahs, the women arising, women just living out dangerously for God. And I just bless you to rise up and live dangerously in every aspect that God has called you, unafraid of any threat, knowing that you are covered, that Jesus gives you an invisibility cloak, protects you from all harm, that even direct attempts that are made at, uh, on your life will yield no fruits, no results. In fact, Actually, that the kind of result it will yield will be to convert those who are coming up against you because they will be so convinced, they will be so blown away by all of their efforts backfiring on them that they just submit to the God that you serve. So I just bless you to encounter God even from tonight in a very different and in a very in a very heightened way going forward. And I want to bless anybody who is from Ibadan or um, Abiyoko this call, and also the Jebu people who have been well represented. There's such, you play, you've played a pivotal role 
in the spread of the gospel. We have the story of revival because your community, your town were receptive to the gospel of Jesus. Your lands first allowed the watering um, with the blood of Jesus. You know, your land was first healed for us. And so I bless you that anyone who has this heritage, that it will call back, call your name. It will call you. It will call you to carry that fire and stoke it and spread it in this. You have a beautiful heritage and let that heritage speak for you. Let that heritage really speak for you and become something that you're proud to wear, not because it is just history, but because it's, it's, it's an experience you're living every day. You draw on that and you say, do again, Lord, what you did before. Do it through me because I'm a conduit. That, yeah, that's what it is. You're conduits. You, you really have... Um, you have a place and a part to play for the revival that we're stoking today in, in our time. So thank you so much, everybody, for your time and your patience, for always coming through for your contributions. Not as much as we usually get, but we receive it. Thank you, Bolanle, for chiming in. Yeah, you receive it for your husband and your children. Amen. And we give you, actually, I just declare over you that I, when you said you receive it for your husband and children, I got the impression of double portion. So. I'm not quite sure what the double portion specifically is, but God is releasing a double portion of that heritage of carriers and stewards of the move of God that your eyes will be the first to see it and jump into that river. You know, it's, it's a difficult work for people who are the first to see and jump and, and stare up something. It's easier when other people come, you know, they, they've seen what's happening and they, oh, this is what's happening, let me join. But the person that had to first carry the message, that's a hard work. And God has a special reward for them. I'm convinced of that. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you next month. Um, more interesting stories. And we just have two more months. We have October and we have November. And would you believe it? We would have gone through the entire book. So God bless you all. Have a really good night. Ebube, thank you for chiming in. Good night, everybody. Itunu says, my mom is Ijebu, so I receive the blessings as well. Amen. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right. Good night, Thank everybody. Everyone. Take Bye. care. Bye.